With great joy, we invite you to be in the presence of Arya Maharishi Kapriti Maya during the 10-day Presence Immersive happening in Goa in December 2024. To know more, to register, and to make your travel plans, click the link in the description below. That's how you, that information comes to the system. The more a person is tuned in, the more information they receive. So if I'm really tuned in, then I can look at him and I know exactly what his system needs. And I can give it also then. You understood, no, what I was saying? Ashmandra. But practice, huh? not thank you only. <laughs> practice what I've told you. <laughs> I know because he has a question which I don't really want to answer, but... <laughs> but my mandate is to answer the question, so I'll do it. Namaste. So my question... <laughs> Maybe it's another one. It's, yes. Uh, I'd like to have your response, your reflection on the life, the work, the realization and the legacy of Osho. <laughs> okay, so about his life, I mean, I can only speak from what I know. And uh, he was clearly enlightened, no question about it. Which is also very easy to see in his eyes. Enlightened meaning someone who has been in samadhi states, has been detached from the system in increasing states of dissolution of identity until the identity drops away. And then the regaining of identity until a re-entry into the system happens. So that's what one can say about his life, that he practiced, took up various practices that led him into a state of enlightenment. And that after his enlightenment, his reintegration into the system was partial. He was never able to really sit back into the system like many spiritual masters of the last few centuries. The process of enlightenment has been an experimental process in the history of spirituality, where the human being forced the consciousness out to see what would happen. He comes towards the end of that process of knowledge about cosmic experience, transcendental states, states of dissolution of identity and the associated harm that is also done to the body and the inability to reintegrate in such a way that the person is aware of what is happening around them to an extent which gives them the ability to determine how the forces around them play out. So. In his case, he was not able to reintegrate fully. And therefore, the self-realization processes are also limited. Because when one is out for that long, one is so detached. Detached physically, detached emotionally, even conceptually detached. Detached in the creative part of the being. And this detachment also results in a much more prolonged process of reintegration and self-realization. So all these masters had to come back into their bodies and start to self-realize, to realize that that is also this, and that the integration of the system with this has to proceed. This was normally when they set up their sanghas, they set up their... how the sanghas grew around them, generally. 
Normally they didn't set up something, it just happened organically. And the more they were outside the system, the longer they were in samadhi states, the less they were able to really transmit and influence what is around them in a way that is not harmful to others. So it's a very delicate thing that happens over there. In his case, he was, he did, you know, return into a system, he was able to do a lot of things, but he was also physically not strong anymore. He was, his system had been, had put up with a lot in those processes, as with other masters. So that, in a nutshell, about, you know, what happened with him and his life as such, what happened with his Sangha and how things went out of hand is... Basically, it is because when, when that total sitting in the system doesn't happen and that reintegration is not almost complete, it normally cannot be complete, but... So the self-realization processes are processes of humility, of going into a state of humbleness, conscious surrender. When a person goes into samadhi states, those are not states that have to do with surrender. You do not learn surrender when you go into a samadhi state. The surrender process comes after that, when you have to reintegrate and move into surrender to the master of the being, the soul. Because the cosmic experience which happens when enlightenment happens, it's a dissolution of identity, so there's nothing to surrender and there's nothing to surrender to. But when that same person reintegrates into the system, they will have to <clears throat> enter into a subject-object, into a duality, to realize the non-dual within the system. Because the non-dual experience must be corporeal and terrestrial, else it is not non-dual. So, in his case, this did not happen. The self-realization processes did not reach a certain conclusion. Which is also why there was all that chaos around him. And of course, it was said that he's creating this chaos, but I don't think so. It just happened like that. What would you say about his legacy as a huge pool of people who have been deeply influenced by his work? And, uh, and it seems that perhaps more than most or any other master to date, he really uh, wanted to include the feminine and uh, bring this aspect of celebration and break down this uh, control of monasticism and all that. The Zorba yeah. the Buddha was his ideal. So it seems a mixed legacy. Do you have any insights? I can only speak of the experience I have with those who have been his students and those that have taken up his practices after he passed away. There are cases of partial enlightenment happening, many, many. So the, the meditation practices that he, that he gave are practices that push the consciousness out of the system into semi-samadhi states or sometimes even into, into nirvikalpa samadhi states. What this results in, in very many people, that especially the ones that are enlightened, is that they are basically helpless after that, and they want to reintegrate into the system and actually always ask the question, after enlightenment, what? They do have sanghas around them, but those who come to me, especially the ones who come privately, because as you know, I do give private meetings to gurus, because I understand that, you know, it can be quite challenging. Um, what I have seen without exception is that there is a sense of not being in touch with the self, with the, with the actual center, the soul. And, 
and they've said it to me, enunciated it. I do know now, I am enlightened, but there is something beyond that which I, I know I have to reach. And it is this process of actually pulling down into the, into the Self-realization, which they have to do, because they've taken up a, a practice which is taking them outside the system. These are all practices of the past. They will not hold in the future because they are detaching from life rather than embracing. They cause the system to detach, and detachment is not the key to living in this body. It is embracing which is the key, and embracing as an act of surrender to the soul, not detaching as an act of experiencing states of dissolution of identity. Mm. So it is a diametrically opposite movement, which is already on its way and now part of the new trajectory. Mm. So while many of his practices do in the sense, loosen people up. I don't know how far that loosening up is necessary, because if one has to stay in this system, it is a, it is a steadiness and a, and a coherence and presentness that is needed to actually be a servant, an instrument of the, of the guru within, the antar guru, to bend down to that. And it is very, very difficult to enter into those states of surrender if the system is most of the time outside or has been. For those that have experienced certain liberation, it may have brought them some freedom into the system, but what happens in the long run is that they realize that the freedom has to be experienced here and now with the eyes open, present. And that when that happens, one realizes that there is no such thing as freedom and liberation. There's nothing to be liberated from. So, in the long run, to take up those practices doesn't seem to bring that much. It does, to a certain extent, maybe loosen up something, but if the chakras have to become more pliable and if that energy has to flow, one has to bend down. And bending down does not happen if your consciousness is out of the system. So, it's a question mark, mm. I feel. I had uh, quite an intensive and extensive connection with an enlightened teacher. He was one of the extreme Osho sannyasis who went into the extreme hedonism, the sex and the drugs. And after Osho's passing, he went extreme into meditation. I would say he had an extreme enlightenment. And then his experience was that like, he lost the functioning of the system and he felt he was taken over by what for him was Ishvara God. And the experience of being with him, he was extremely powerful energetically in the meditation and the awareness. But his behavior was somewhat uh, bizarre and out of, according to my feeling, out of whack, out of cruel, uh, using people, abusing people, uh, very crazy things with money. And in the end, he had a son and it really softened him and he became more normal, he started wearing normal clothes and uh, he used to say that as far as awareness goes, he felt he had gone to the maximum but what, was, what he noticed was the experience of love. But for him it was something that came and went and it was kind of interesting but not that important in a way and awareness was the thing. Um, but on his deathbed, he died in 2012, and he had uh, a swelling of the lining of the heart, which went to multiple organ failure. He had some kind of epiphany, and he was crying and saying, now I know that love is, love is what's important, something like this. Well, this is exactly what I'm saying. When I say surrender to love, it's not just a pretty sentence on a, on a poster, you know. It is a very, very important and powerful and, and absolutely 
indispensable uh, posture to take. When we, when we are here and now, present, aware and alert, that is when the surrender to love, which is the soul, which is the Antarguru, the master of the being, happens. It cannot happen if you are outside. It cannot happen. So any meditative practice that takes you outside, that spaces you out, you can just put a red cross on it. It's not going to take you anywhere. And as I said, many enlightened beings, gurus, in fact, just recently a few of them have come to see me and this is the only discourse. It is the spirituality of the future. It is not going to be going into deep meditative states, into dynamic meditation states and leaving the system because that will not open the heart. Or I don't want to use open the heart because that's a misused phrase. It is about bending down and surrender to the soul, the antarguru, the master of the being that is love and it does not happen through long hours of meditation, cannot happen. It happens through being present here and now and discerning in every moment between the impulse of soul and the voice of ego. So all of these enlightened beings that have happened through the meditations of Osho, and I can tell you, Aishman Baba, All of these people, they will have to come down and get in touch with soul and if they don't do it, it will be in the last moments before they die that, and it is not epiphanic in nature, it is a shock that happens. It's not what in nature? So? It's not an epiphany, it is a shock to the system that an entire lifetime has been spent there when actually it could be here. And this is also what Ramdas said when shortly before he passed away, I think it was that the stroke brought him down to the, to the body that he had been trying to reject all his life. There is nothing here to reject, it's only about this. That is why I say I am this and I know that this is very... It's very shocking when I say this, many people say, well, then what about this master? They are of the past and they are our masters. We have to bend down to them. We have to respect and revere them because they explored the cosmos. But it is now time in the history of spirituality to explore the materiality of the system through the expansion of consciousness into each of the layers of consciousness through the processes of surrender to source, to surrender, 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 surrender. There's nothing to look for there, it is not there. Once it is seen, this will come back to hound you if you leave. And that is what happened to him. And in fact, just in the last ten days, I've had meetings with masters, enlightened masters who have exactly asked this question. It was quite... It was quite shocking, actually. Having spent a lifetime and then damaging the body to the extent where that complete reintegration into the here and the now and into an absolute bending down is not possible because the conceptual, for example, is not capable of imagining it. So it's always better to stay, be here and now. And having said that, there's not that much more to say about Osho. These are all masters. They were exploring a space, now they've come back with information, now we know what to do with it. We proceed along a trajectory that takes us to the here and the now in direct communion but in a duality relationship with the, with the soul. And as that relationship deepens, the duality falls away, but in a sense of being here and now, aware, 
not a non-dual of detachment, but a non-dual of embracing. Ashman Baba. And that's what it's about. Mm. And, and it's a whole subcontinent that is aiming outward. What am I to say? If I have to say it, I'll say it. The ironic thing is that uh, Ram Dass's famous book from the 60s was called Be Here Now. Well, I hope that he at least partly went with what he wrote, if that is what he wrote. Mm. The thing is that that here now, for those that were in those processes, was not the here now of the, of the terrestriality and the corporeality. It was a conceptual here now, from a vantage point of detachment. It's, it's not the here and now that we speak about. When I say here and now, I mean here and now, eyes open, no need to meditate long hours, present, in surrender, bending down to this man in front of you, because he's the Divine, that's what it is. It's not about observing him from a detached vantage point as the Divine, but actually seeing it, very, very real, with the eyes open and aware of everything, present and in surrender to my Master, and therefore surrender to you, my Master, therefore surrender to you, my Master, the Soul, therefore surrender to you, to everyone and everything. That's what the new spirituality is about, and will be, it's going to be that trajectory now. Makes sense to me. Yes, it, it's... and it has to make sense. If it doesn't make sense, then it's nonsense. <laughs> Thank you for answering the question. I didn't answer all those fancy words that you asked about legacy and this and that, but I think it's all there. That. Life... what did you say? Life... Life, work... Work... Realization, Realization and legacy. Oh yes, I did answer all of those, actually. Maybe I can think of some more adjec adjectives. <laughs> if you're very present in this moment, you won't think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was hitting under the belt. <laughs> you can also ask anything else if you want, if there's time afterwards. He's keeping an eye. Yes, Sven... Svenja is your name. I'll try to speak as fast as possible, so everyone can be answered. Namaskaram. invited to a live online satsang with Maharishi Kapriti this Sunday. To know more, click the link in the description below.